Welcome to adding more spindle time to your lathes clock. We thank you for taking time out of your day to join us and hope you are able to take something away from today's presentation. Gabe, you may go ahead and share your screen. And while he does, I would like to introduce today's presenter. Gabe Morelli is the regional manager with Marotta Machinery USA in Nashville, Tennessee. Take it away, Gabe. Okay, uh, well, morning everybody, thank you for joining us today. My name is Gabe Morelli. I'm regional manager for uh, a large uh, portion of uh, the south and, and up north where you all are. And I have been with Murata for nine years. I've uh, My background is in machining, so I spent 17 years in production shops in uh, Southern California before we moved to Tennessee to uh, work in the distribution side of the business. So I have, uh, I have uh, uh, worked on machines, programmed them, uh, set them up, um, managed two large uh, 50 plus person shops for several years before I came over to the distribution side. And in that role, I've worked in applications, uh, marketing, sales, design, uh, engineering, and now management. So uh, my range comes all the way from pushing a broom in a shop all the way to uh, helping jobs, uh, job shops uh, achieve uh, better productivity. So today uh, we are partnering with uh, Productivity to um, show you guys how to add more spindle time to your lathe's clock. Uh, the idea of this is in, in the competitive environment that we are in, um, your machine's ability to make parts is the only way you can make money. And if you, we can add more output on, on your uh, spindles, uh, that would be an increased productivity and bottom line, more, more sales of parts at the end of the day. So what we're gonna cover is uh, the limitations and pains of bar feedings, inefficiencies of uh, what I call the transfer cutoff process, advantages of sawing over bar feeding, advantages of slug loading versus transfer, uh, external material handling, and then I have a cost uh, uh, worksheet that will show you the advantages of um, loading slugs versus bar feeding. We'll have a little summary and a Q&A section at the end. Um, I want to say that Murata Machinery uh, is the leading manufacturer of automated turning cells in the world. We have a large presence in the U.S. with the headquarters in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, by far we sell more automated turning centers in the world than any, anybody else. Um, but because of that, I'm not advocating that bar feeding is a bad thing. We have a whole lineup of machines that are bar fed machines, nor do I work for a saw company, so I'm not advocating saws. I'm just going to say that there's parts that are perfect for bar feeding and there's parts that are bar fed that are better uh, suited for uh, slug loading instead. So we're going to talk a little bit about the limitations of a bar feed. And uh, first, of, first and foremost, in <coughs> in order to uh, auto feed any kind of parts, the bar feeder is limited to the spindle diameter of your lathe. So any other part cannot be run in auto mode if, unless it comes in a, in a bar form and fits through the spindle. So castings, forgings, or slugs are not uh, conducive to running in automation. Uh, maximum allowed RPM is an issue because you have uh, limitations sometimes with the bushing pusher limitations, spindle liner, uh, bar straightness can limit the RPM, bar max, max weight, sometimes a spindle uh, or a bar feed combination cannot handle the total length of bar uh, at, at its maximum mass, so you're limiting the RPM. Uh, part quality requirements. So if you are having any kind of bar whip issues, you may be limited on RPM or something to hold tight surface finish requirements. Um, uh, bar whipping also will affect tool life uh, finishes and uh, actually uh, minimize your processing speed if you're having to limit that because of bar whipping. Uh, spindle energy and uh, uh, spindle and energy utilization. So a CNC lathe, when it's in the pickoff cycle, is being used simply as a saw, and the bar feeder is used as a rack to hold the material. No value is being added in this process to the part itself. So while you are 
picking off with the sub spindle or second spindle and you're pulling the bar out and cutting off, you are not adding any value to the part. All you're doing is transferring the part from one spindle to the other and removing it off the end of the bar. Uh, all that time is taken out of the CNC's capability to continue to make a part. That long transfer cycle reduces that allowed time to make uh, value added to that to that part. Uh, spindle horsepower is used utilized now for spinning up uh, that bar that's 12 foot long when it begins, and it's not cap not available for making parts. And also during the transfer cycle, you have two spindles running, and that's additional energy wasted. Other issues are premature wear on the bearing, so uh, this bar bar um, whipping issue comes to life again here in this in this conversation because that adds a lot of vibration and, and can reduce the wear uh, or the life of the spindle bearings. Uh, maintaining proper bar feed alignment is critical. I remember we had an issue with uh, two machines, the bar feeder kept moving and constantly had to realign them. Uh, bar feed oil contaminates machine coolant and also is just something else that has to handle during changeovers. You have a oil mess everywhere. Um, the inefficiency is the transfer cutoff process. So this is a long and risky process that again, I, like I said before, does not add any value to the part. Both spindles are tied up in not making parts during the long, uh, that long cycle. Okay, the cutoff tool is expensive and risky. Actually, as you all know, we, you reach zero surface footage at the center of the cut, and that's not conducive to a good cutting condition. And even though cutoff blades are made to handle that condition, that's still not a good cutting condition. Uh, one bar feed is needed for each lathe to do accommodate the automated feeding of, of material. In the picture right here, if you can uh, see my mouse, I, I, I hope you can see my mouse. Uh, anything to the left of this, uh, this edge of the machine is doing nothing but storing material. Okay, the part making capability of this, uh, this floor layout is from this line to the right. So the value added machining that takes place in this machine shop is happening from here to the right. Look at how much floor space is utilized just to hold material uh, and, and nothing else. So this is not adding again any value to your value to your part making process. All the value is on on the right side of that line. Okay. Floor space, <coughs> that floor space again is not dedicated to making part. All that floor space or two thirds of that floor space is dedicated just to holding material. Many spindle liners, pushy, pushers, bushings and oil are required. Ergonomics are also not ideal on bars. A lot of times uh, bar feeders have to be loaded on the top rack and lifting up bars is not very uh, conducive to good ergonomics. Also unloading material when a job is done and you still have bars in the rack is uh, not ergonomic or safe. Uh, advantages of sawing over bar feeding is that a saw first and foremost cuts uh, effectively and works at a much lower cost overall. Cutting place, uh, the cutting takes place while parts are being made on the lathe, external to the process. So that long transfer cutoff process is eliminated because you're cutting outside the machine. Um, you also remove a high risk tool from the lathe. I think um, and, and I hear this not just from my experience uh, that the that the cutoff insert is pretty much the highest risk tool in the lathe process. Uh, cost to buy a lathe is about the same cost to buy a bar feed, and we can talk about that a little bit more later. Um, cost per cut is lower than cutting off in the lathe. OK, so again, the price of the insert versus a saw blade and the amount of cuts you get per tool is much longer on a saw. And uh, a saw also will produce uh, average, a much shorter bar remnant. We're going to use this in our in our justification, uh, so keep that in mind. Um, I know a lot of saws uh, uh, advertise less than a one inch remnant. And on a bar feed, I know depending on the length of pusher, back how far you get back to the collet or the work holding jaws and how much the part sticking out, uh, you can sometimes add add one more part to the bar if you could effectively use that bar. Um, bundling also saves additional time and money. Um, don't take my word for this. Um, I've actually gone outside of our industry to an expert 
and uh, the consensus consensus is that uh, everybody saves while we bundle, and nobody knows that better than Flow. Um, and the automatic saw can feed several lathes. So again, if you have a lathe that's fed by slugs, there's no need to repeat bar feed purchases uh, for each additional lathe. One saw can feed many lathes. I have a customer in Alabama that feeds uh, six Miratech twin spindle machines and six Akuma single spindle machines with uh, with robots with one, one saw. Um, uh, we eliminate uh, the moving long and heavy stock through the shop floor. So if you're having a lot of bar feeds, you probably see this or this as, as methods to get material to each bar feeder somehow. Or people are walking with bars on their shoulder. I've seen that too through the shop that you know is not safe or ergonomic. But you need this condition in order to feed uh, material to each lathe. Uh, bar end prep is not required, and I don't know how many bar feeders nowadays um, um, need to have the bar end prepped for a collet, um, but I think still about 50, what I'm hearing is about 50% of bar feeders require bar end prepping. So that's another operation I'm not even going to get into right now because I don't know how, how much that affects your production. Um, uh, also, again, I talked about the premature wear on bearings. The spindle keeps coolant from being contaminated uh, of bar feed oil when you're not uh, bringing that in over the, the material. <clears throat> uh, the cutoff uh, advantages of uh, gantry loading now, which is what we are talking. Um, so now the part size is no longer limited to your spindle bore capacity. So most most lays nowadays are sold in, in, you know, the larger capacity lays effectively are sold in two and a half or three inch bore uh, for bar feeding. Uh, but why should you be limited to auto loading that machine or auto feeding that machine to just that bore? OK, so you can run parts that are larger than the bore size automatically if you had slug, uh, slugging capabilities in the gantry loader. A gantry can also auto load parts other than round bar stock, different shape parts. And with the gantry, we do all the material handling outside the work envelope. So the transfer, the, cut, the, the pass off, the turnaround of the part to load on the second spindle is all handled externally the, to the process. So that maximizes, and here's where the key is, that's where we maximize your spindle utilization. Your spindle should be making parts, not transferring them. Uh, we remove that expensive cutoff insert we talked about. We want to get rid of that guy. Uh, we load and unload a spindle in about seven to ten seconds based on our model. And we have large, large machines that load in about 14 seconds, but that's talking about 50 pound parts. Um, but our normal, our bread and butter machines are in between the seven and 10 second load and load time. That's up to eight inch, uh, eight to 12 inch diameter parts. Uh, floor space and cost savings uh, is achieved when you have multiple lays and you're not buying all those bar feeders. So a, a, a condition like this can be handled with um, with just one saw, if you have the right saw in the right work. Long bar spuck also does not need to move around the shop. Like I showed that on the picture, you have to crane or cart material to each one of these bar feeders taking up room, uh, needing needing uh, an ergonomic situation to do that. So I'm going to illustrate with a couple of videos here um, what we're talking about. And I, I'm thinking you're getting the picture of what we're talking about. So the first two videos are talking about a, the process of handing off. So again, what I said earlier is this is no value added to your part. So on the as I start this first video, we start the cutoff cycle. We do the pickoff. And we start cutting off. Now notice neither one of these two videos show the, the, the next part being loaded or the bar being pulled out. So right there, we spent about 18 seconds. And if we still had to load another part, uh, it'd be another three to four seconds of the cycle time, maybe more. And we did not make a part. So we tied up this lathe for about 20, 25 seconds to do nothing, but move apart from one spindle to the other and then uh, remove it from the end of the bar. Same thing here. This tap is the last part making process in, in there. Now the cutoff blade, the pick off. So 
same thing here. We do not have uh, a part being pulled out. But all that time, about 20, 25 seconds was wasted just moving apart from one spindle to the other and removing it off the end of the bar. Now this video, I'm going to I'm going to run it once and then I'm going to slow slow down and just show you uh, and watch carefully. So we are going to pick up from a feeder table with our gantry and we're going to I'm going to show you how fast we load and unload apart. So this is our part stacked outside the machine. We travel over. We start right now. We open the door, close it and we're making a part. So that took eight seconds. And now externally, we handle the part in our turnaround station. And now we hand it back to the gantry. It goes in and it loads and unloads the second spindle. I'm going to back this up again and I'm going to play it one more time and I'm going to stop for a second. So, oh. Sorry about that. I had that happen before. So if I stop right here, this is a cycle time added to the machining process to, to transfer the part. The spindle is up and running other than the eight seven eight ten seconds it takes to load and unload apart so if an average transfer cutoff process is 25 to 30 seconds some are longer um you you would you would gain about 22 20 22 17 18 seconds whatever it is you need to calculate that yourself we're going to have that in the worksheet in a little bit when we're going to cover that so every part though you're going to add 17 to 25 seconds to the cycle time okay so i'm going to explain here a little bit of the external loader cycle which you saw in that video we normally have a if the workflow is from left to right we have an infeed device on this side it can be anything we custom make these or we have standard offerings but we normally pick up a raw slug we position above the spindle shutter to um, uh, wait for the spindle to be done when it open when we're done we open and we get in and out in seven to ten seconds and that is unload a part flip load another part get out close the door start machining then we hand off the part to these uh, what we call e and f chucks and these are the handoff and flip over uh, uh, stations and then we do the same thing the gantry picks up again loads and unloads when the spindle is done in seven to ten seconds and then drops a part off in an exit device exit devices can be customized to do more than just hold a part out in the conveyor we can gauge we can pin stamp we can uh, wash we can uh, do many things to the part because we have the part in our hand we add a lot of value added processes downstream of the cutting time but that's something uh, you can discuss with your sales uh, person if you need more more help with that. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people think automation is hard or robots are hard or auto loading is hard. Bar feeding is kind of simple. You put a part in a tube, it pushes when it's done. You put another part in and it pushes again, but it's not hard to do this. So we have our most common offering is a 14 station feeder table that stacks slugs vertically uh, in, in on these pallets. Uh, the pallets are easily adjusted for different diameters within the range of that machine's loading capacity. And these poles, these three poles move concentrically on a spider. So when you put different size stock, you simply move them in and out by loosening them and adjusting them to the, to the stock, new stock diameter. Okay, our gantry and our turnover station jaw stroke is really large on our bread and butter machines from 32 to 50 millimeters. So this means that if on a larger machine, if you have a part that's within a two inch range of the last one, you may be able to run many parts of that two inch range without having to do any changeover. Imagine being able to run bar stock within two inch in the same spindle liner. 
This is kind of what it equates to here. We can run a, about a two inch range of parts with one set of jaws. Um, if you have to change over jaws, we have many designs. So a standard is just three jaw chucks with two, two bolts each. Um, we have a single um, a single design with a half a turn of a of a screw. You can remove the a jaw insert and replace it. We have some that uh, pop in with no uh, with no tools needed at all with detents, and we have many many designs of quick change tooling. So, if quick change is what you desire, we are the engineering company that can do that for you. And then our standard turnaround station, we call it the E and F station. Uh, also has the same type of gr gripper and stroke and capacity of these. And uh, this is very simple. It's incorporated in the machine as part of the uh, as part of the package. Uh, so how to justify this? Um, I'm going to do a little worksheet. So we're going to talk about uh, Muratec plus a saw versus a bar feed uh, and a lathe with an opposing spindle. <coughs> And I got to drag this over, so sorry. And now let me um, hope you will need to tell me if this is large enough. Is that is that yep. the viewable? I I think that looks good. Okay. If it doesn't, anybody uh, drop a note in the chat. Okay. So this is a, a sheet. Uh, I will. I'll. I'll fill out some data based on what I know, but we'll, we'll make it up. Uh, this is a sheet that your salesperson will have, and if you want to uh, investigate your own solution and see how you can justify uh, the differences and what this would make to your bottom line, please get together with your salesperson and go over the sheet. They'll be able to do that. So again, we're gonna we're gonna compare a brand X lathe with uh, a sub spindle, uh, 12, 12 foot automatic bar feeder, a, you know, transformer, chip conveyor, chucks, tool heads, you know, basically a turnkey for a part versus a Muratech uh, live tool machine, twin spindle, twin turret gantry, a feeder table like I showed you and same thing, everything else. So the difference, uh, the part making capability I want to say is equal here, okay? Now, um, what I'm going to fill out is the data here. So the raw bar length in inches is 12 foot is 144 inches on both machines. And I'm going to do this again with a shorter bars because uh, um, I asked for people to tell me if you use short loaders or 12 footers and you have there's about a 50 50 mix. But let's start with 12 foot bars. Um, both both machines start with a 12 foot bar, a finished part length. I'm going to just use the number 2.45. Let's say that's a finished part length. Um, the facing allowance. So when I do a cutoff and um, um, a cutoff process, my standard was leaving 15 thousandths per, per face, uh, but you can put whatever you want. So I'm going to leave 30 thousandths total on the part with the, the uh, in the lathe with the cutoff. But on the saw, since it's a rougher cut, I leave normally 30 thousandths per side. So I'm going to put 60 thousandths. Um, cut off with, I believe the standard is uh, 118. That's what I get uh, a three millimeter wide cutoff blade. And a saw is normally uh, 1 16th uh, of an inch. Um, again, when you get this, you can put in your own numbers, so don't feel like I'm forcing something uh, that makes it look good for me. You can put in whatever you like. Uh, minimum end of bar remnant, and this is the qu big question. I don't know what it is on your machine, but I let's say for a two and a half inch part we're making here, it's normally a little bit more than one part we throw away, or maybe not, but let's just say it's one part. We just can't get one more part out of that bar. And then on the saw, I'm being told one inch, uh, is a remnant. Uh, number of parts in order. So let's just say we have an order for 4,500 parts. Oops. Um, price of this part. So uh, I don't know. I'm just going to say this part's a $4 part. No, not 400. That would be nice. A $4 part. Uh, machining cycle time minus cutoff and trial. So this is just machining time of the part again. 
I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, suppose here that the lathe has two turrets because I have two turrets on my machine, so I will process half the part on one and half the part on another. So just to make things equal here, let's just say that this part processes in uh, 120 and 120 seconds on both machines. The processing time is the same. Now, if it was a single turret lathe, this cycle time would be longer because I have the ability to machine with two turrets and two spindles. Um, but we'll we'll make the assumption that everything is the same here. The transfer and cutoff time uh, that we talked about uh, on this lathe, let's just use 28 seconds. And then the end of bar changeover. So at the end of your 12 foot bar, uh, according to one of the leading bar feed providers uh, to unload the bar, remove the remnant, drop it in a box, load another bar, and get it ready for cut is 45 seconds. Uh, okay, and then um, I'm go here and on a mirror tech, we can load and unload in, I'm gonna say the bigger machine, 10 seconds. Okay. Um, hours available per day. Let's say that you run two shifts of eight hours, so there's 16 hours available a day. And let's put this efficiency rating at 85%. That's actually kind of low for a Muratech. It's auto loaded, but I'll, I'll, let's just use that for a comparison. <clears throat> and the shop rate, I don't know what shop rates are. To tell you the truth, I'm so out of touch with that. But I'm guessing a machine of this value should run at $75 an hour and days a year. Uh, of production is 240. You see why I put that in there. Now, here's the results. So production minutes per day. Number of bars needed to run the job. So because of the remnant and because of the um, difference in width of the saw, the facing allowance versus the uh, width of the cutoff blade and facing allowance. We need 84 bars to run the job on the bar feed, and we need 82 bars to run the job on the uh, on the lathe with the cutoff blade. So the total material loss just in difference is 80 inches. So we we lose 138 inches on the bar feed with the cutoff and remnants and we lose only 58 inches with the saw. So much more effective use of material. OK, so that's 80 inches of uh, material available to make more parts or less scrap. Total parts per day, including bar change time. So if we take this cycle time uh, of 120 plus the, the transfer time plus the bar feed change versus the cycle time plus the load and load, we have 325 parts made on the bar feed 376 parts made on the lathe with the automation. 51 additional parts a day made all of these being equal, okay? On sales, if you sell that part for, we said, what do we say, $4 a part, uh, $1,300 daily sales, that's what a job shop do, does, is sells machining versus $1,500. So $200 a day savings uh, machine hours to complete orders is 158 versus 138. So 20 less hours used to complete the order based on the savings of transfer time, bar fee changeover. Uh, total sales revenue, this is simply the 4,000 parts times $4 an hour apart. Uh, but total cost to run the shop at that shop rate, and again, this, this may be a blown out number, but that job cost $11,800 uh, $11, to run on the bar feed and $10,000. So it's a $1,500 savings uh, sh saved on the Muratech. Okay. Now, this is if the job was 4,000 pieces. What is, or four, I think, 4,500 pieces. These are the results that the job was that much. But let's say it is a job that is not changeover and it just repeats and runs all year long. <clears throat> so, Production minutes per year, if this was 240 days a year, same thing, 85% uh, uh, efficiency, uh, 16 hours a day, you'd have 195,000 minutes a year. Parts per year made on the bar feed is 77,900 versus 90,000. That's 12,000 additional parts a year. And then sales revenue per year based on the part cost is 311 
versus 360, so an additional $50,000 a year in sales. Uh, over three years, basically you multiply that by three. So 100, nearly $150,000 additional revenue in three years. And again, this is if that job was to repeat and run forever. Uh, but anyway, I, I hope you guys are, uh, please submit questions regarding this if you, if you have any. Um, when, if you want to know the math behind this, there's the worksheet is behind here and there's no secrets here. It's very simple math, but all the calculations are being made down here. Um, I, I don't mind uh, your salesperson sharing this with you and you can see there's no tricks here or anything. Um, the, uh, this is a simple justification sheet and uh, I would love for you to ask for your samples to be run through this and see if you can uh, think there's some value to it. Um, OK, so I'm going to exit this, go back here and just summarize. So <clears throat> cover basically what we talked about is the material handling externally uh, maximizes your spindle cutting time or adds what, I, what we call this. We're adding more spindle time to your clock. Transfer and cutoff inside the lathe is inefficient, slow, risky, does not add any value to the workpiece. An automatic saw can feed several spindles, eases raw material handling, improves ergonomics in the shop, and maximizes use of floor space. Saw cutting happens internal to the machining process and is less expensive per cut. Slug loading effectively utilizes the lathe's part making capacity and is not limited to just auto running bar stock. So you can run parts of different shapes and sizes. Um, that's all that covers everything we had for the uh, presentation. I'm open for uh, any questions or uh, suggestions. Please, please ask. Thank you very much, Kate. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a few questions, and if you do have any questions, please go ahead and type them in. And um, there is a slight delay, so we'll hang out here an extra minute or two uh, while questions are coming in. And if you have any questions after the webinar, feel free to email me at webinars at productivity.com and I will make sure we get those answered for you. Uh, Jeff has a question. Uh, Gabe, does the auto loader on a Muratech have to be programmed for every part or can multiple parts use the same loader program? <coughs> Great question. Uh, the uh, loader program is one. So the sequence in that loader cycle I showed you in that one digital format is one program that stays the same. The only thing that changes is the part loading uh, length possibly so that the spindle is always in the same center. So we, we only have to change how deep we put the part in and there's every program is a copy of the main program and you have different teach points. And when you change from one part to the other, the only thing you change is possibly the loading depth into the chuck and the loading depth into the ENF chucks when we turn the part around and then the second spindle. So yeah, you basically copy the program, you copy your loader table, everything stays the same except like the length, the length differences. And if you know, hey, a part's two and a half millimeters longer, you can just go into that those few positions and they're named in our controller and you can just change this by two and a half millimeters and pretty much go. Okay, and part two of that question is, uh, also, can the machine store multiple loader programs like it would for machining programs? Yes, the loader. Pro this is a FANUC 31 series control, 31 or 32 I control, and um, the the FANUC side of memory, just like any other FANUC machine, is by hand by by FANUC. But the loader side is Muratech side, and we have a, a capability of about 32 programs standard, and we have an expansion package. It depends on the complexity of the program because if we do additional things with it, uh, we can expand that by about three times. The programs can be saved uh, offline, just like you would a standard CNC program if you ever run out of memory. Okay. Uh, another question, does the gantry loader have a teach mode or process like many robots do for ease of programming? Yes, uh, and a very simple one too. You have a hand pendant. Uh, where you will dial the, uh, the the gantry hand to the to the part of the loading position, and then better than that, when we're loading a part, uh, I'm going to illustrate this with this water bottle. If you can see my camera, when you're when you're loading the part into the chuck, uh, what we do is in order to make sure you're on center, 
uh, what you do is you you clamp the the chuck onto the part, and then a crosshair comes up in the control, and it tells you which axis we're putting a little bit of load on, and you can keep moving that and teaching it until it's on on zero perfectly. So if you change jaws <coughs> on the gantry loader, maybe you didn't put them in the same position, and the part's not perfectly round, we can definitely put that in the. Uh, 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 we can reteach that position and perfectly align the uh, the gantry handle with the with the loading position very easily. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Daniel is asking, what is estimated setup time to do a changeover on a gantry loader? Okay, um, it depends on your tooling. So um, uh, let's call the lathe changeover the same. So the chucking, if you're changing the part. Uh, the lathe is the lathe. You still got a chuck. You got uh, maybe you changing the drill or whatever. So we're not talking about that. If you change all the uh, tooling, uh, we have customers that do quick change tooling that have five to ten minute changeovers. They literally um, uh, design or we design and build uh, snap in tooling. Uh, we have customers that achieve a full changeover in 20 minutes and some we have customers that takes them 20 minutes to find an Allen wrench. So you you know your shop, but we can we can des design and engineer very simple changeover uh, components or suggest designs for changeover components to make that very easily. OK, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott is asking, how are the jaws kept clean for loading parts? <coughs> well, the, the gantry loader doesn't have any air blow. We can add, that can be a function that we add, but we do uh, ex um, uh, let me start by saying this. Uh, Murotech would not be in business if we could not control chips. So we are experts at controlling chips and chips is the bane of our existing in machining in, in the machining world. So I always say we don't make parts, we make chips and parts was left behind. So if we have to pay a lot of attention to the chip control and we spend a lot of time blowing out chucks, designing tooling to be easily cleaned, I'm not going to say it's perfect. It's a perfect environment. As you know, you can never solve sometimes bird nesting, things like that. But we have countermeasures such as um, air sensing to make sure a part is loaded correctly. Our standard loader cycle handles misloaded parts and retries to load the, the machine if the part is not seated right. It, it removes the part, blows the chuck, reloads again. If it doesn't load the first time, we remove that part try loading the second one. Maybe the part had the chip in it, not the chuck. So we have many countermeasures for that. But I'm not going to say that uh, chip control isn't a concern. Uh, however, we have a lot of experience on how to manage that. OK, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Scott is asking, can my part in feed and out feed be something other than the rotary feeder? Yes. Um, what I presented there is a very standard product offering we sell. I'm going to say probably 60% of the machines we we ship ship with one of those tables. But we have customers that parts come from a press maybe, uh, and they come in a conveyor. So we just need a place to pick them up from. But we escape the parts to a, a certain position where our gantry sees it, picks it up. Uh, we have infeed conveyors. We have customers to supply uh, their infeed system. We use bowl feeders. We use hoppers. Um, and for the exit device, the same thing. Sometimes we put parts in dunnage containers, so parts have to be put in a, on, a, on a plastic pallet to either load another machine or to be shipped to an assembly facility. And we can we can make pallet systems that accommodate us putting the parts in, in pockets in the pallet. Uh, simple conveyors, stacking. We sometimes drop the part down a chute and it falls into a into a tote. So it just depends on the customer requirement. But that's what I was showing is a very simple, inexpensive, uh, small footprint way of stacking quite a bit of material. OK, great, thanks. Uh, Jeff is asking, he says, you have experience on both bar feed process and auto load slash gantry process. What are the biggest struggles or hurdles for shops that are investigating or trying to justify making the switch? <coughs> I think something. Uh, and again, I, I, I bought machines. Uh, I, I didn't know about automation when I was working in the machine shop, but but I think the the comfort of a bar feed is something that uh, it's it's hard to get by. Uh, it's something it's a known. And um, the reason we're doing this webinar is to try to educate people that there's other ways. So I believe the comfort level is one. Um, there's a fear of automation. A lot of people fear automation because it's hard. 
we make it simple. I have much more material that talks about how we manage our machine and how we set up our machines. This is not what this webinar is about. Um, but I think justifying, maybe using this tool to justify the cost and see how how much waste of time a transfer process is. I just I just hate to see people. Um, uh, the shorter the cycle, overall cycle of your part, the more that transfer time affects the overall output of your machine. So. Oh, I talked about a minute, uh, 120 second part, I think, or whatever it was. Um, if you, if you, we make many parts that are sub 30 second parts. So if you're talking about adding 30 seconds to a 30 second part, you're cutting your production in half. So, it, but, but don't be afraid of automation. Automation uh, uh, is great, and we have many. Uh, well, we have, uh, we have more installations in North America than anybody else in the world with automated turning and. If uh, anybody um, needs references to this, uh, we're very happy to put you in touch with a lot of people and say bar, bar feeding is not the way to go. It's the most productive way uh, to do to do parts is to do this with a saw. OK, great. Uh, we have one more question. Um, mm -hmm. Daniel is asking, what is the cost of a gantry system versus a bar loader? Um, the gantry is integrated to our machine, so we don't actually separate the cost of it. Um, the, our, our gantry is built by Murata Japan, so we we are um, uh, we bring the machines over from Japan uh, from our, our mothership, uh, and it's not something I price separately, so it's part of the of the machine price. So we we do have single spindle gantry loaded machines, and we have twin spindles. We also have opposing spindle machines like like what you would bar feed with a gantry loader so we actually have customers that bar feed and gantry load slugs so they do bar feed some material and then they have castings that they have to gantry load so we use a combination but i can't tell you that i can't tell you the price of the gantry i can tell you the price of the whole solution okay great joe is asking what is the longest part for your automated systems uh, it, de it depends on the machine size. Um, if you get on our website, um, you would see what uh, you would see a guide. Please, uh, I, I would say contact your salesperson. Uh, we use that number as a loose guide of the limitations of our gantry loader. We have a payload capacity for each size gantry, and then we have a max diameter and length. However, that's more affected by clearances inside the loading area than it is by the payload capacity. Uh, so we may say four inches long and we can get a five inch long part if we can shorten the work holding. And it's a matter of reaching with your gantry. You have a chuck here and you have a gantry coming down. You have to be able to get the part in front of, you know, in front of this chuck without hitting the jaws. So if we can get in there and put it in the chuck and then and then get out of our way, uh, that's the limitation. So we like to look at parts and to tell you what the uh, what the solution is. I will say this: we are a chucker. This is a chucker uh, concept, so it's not for you know very long parts. This is this is why I say there's still a very good use for bar feed lathes because your longer parts and things like that will will uh, uh, will be handled in that manner. As you can see, this picture that's on my screen right now. Um, the, the top picture is we have a shaft loading machine, this gantry loaded. OK, so that top picture is showing a, uh, we have a shaft loading machine um, up to uh, 540 millimeter long parts. It's got upper lower turret. And we have our opposing spindle machines, our MT series. These are two and three turret machines. Th those are the bar feed machines. And then we have our parallel loading machines uh, on the bottom. That's our um, our MWMD series. That's kind of what we're gearing this presentation to. It is a lot of what Muratech is known for in the United States is this twin spindle parallel loading machine concept. Um, we are heavily vested in automotive high production capacity shops. Then the valve and fitting industry, uh, military heavy off-road truck gearing and, and things like that. Um, 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 let's, let's say um, commercial um, like refrigeration and, and stoves and all the valving that goes into that. Any part that's 
you know that you can hold in your hand um, can be done well in a in a mirror attack. Looks like that is the end of the questions. And again, like I said, if you have any questions following the webinar today, uh, just email me at webinars at productivity.com and I will be happy to get those answers for you. And as Gabe mentioned earlier, if you would be interested in finding more about uh, uh, Gabe's worksheet uh, to find out what your profit would be, uh, reach out to your salesperson and they will be able to share that for you. So it looks like there are no further questions. So uh, with that, I would like to just say thank you to our presenter today, Gabe Morelli, Regional Manager of Marotta Machinery USA. And thank all of you for taking the time to join us today for the webinar. As a reminder, we will be posting today's webinar soon on our website at www.productivity.com slash our dash webinars. Um, until next time, we just ask that you have a safe and healthy holiday season, and we'll see you in 2021. Thanks again. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending.